That should probably do it. Looks like some folks are, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. This is um, the Puget Sound Regional Council's Regional Transportation Plan virtual public meeting. Um, and it, we're, obviously this is a Zoom webinar format. You're all um, automatically muted. Um, for questions, please use the Q&A function that you can find at the, the lower part of your screen. We'll, we will have a couple of polls during the webinar. Um, so if you, hopefully you have the latest version of Zoom installed on your computer to participate in those polls and we'll um, instruct you how to do that um, as those polls come up. But with that, once again, I'm, I'm Ben Bekenta, Director of Regional Planning. Thank you all for joining us. I'd like to introduce Kelly McGurdy, who, our Director of Transportation, who will start the webinar today with a presentation uh, that has an overview of the draft regional transportation plan, uh, describes what the plan is, describes the um, anticipated outcomes of those of the plan, um, a bit of the outreach that we've conducted throughout the process and what we've heard through that out, outreach. Um, she'll highlight plan performance and then we have a good chunk of time at the end uh, reserved for you all to pose questions and we have PSRC staff here um, from different parts of our transportation division that um, are subject matter experts and can help to um, answer questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Kelly and I'll also be moderating the questions once we get to that point. So feel free throughout the presentation to start loading up questions as they occur to you in the Q&A and we can take them um, at the end. So take it away, Kelly. All right, thanks, Ben, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. So I'm gonna start with just a little bit of, of who we are for those of you who might not be familiar with the Puget Sound Regional Council. We are a long range planning agency. We focus on growth, economic development and transportation. We also have a role to distribute federal transportation funds, which we do every two years. Um, we have a, a, a role as well related to data. So we do have a lot of uh, data gathering and modeling and analysis tools that we use for regional planning as well as sharing with our member jurisdictions. We forecast into the future. And perhaps more importantly, we, we are a table where we bring uh, diverse stakeholders together to talk about regional issues and uh, help make consensus decisions. We cover the four counties of King, Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish. We have, I believe, over 100 uh, member agencies representing the cities, the four counties, ports, transit agencies, state agencies, and tribal governments, as well as the business uh, community and environmental partners. So we're gonna start off with uh, our very first poll, which I think Michaela will bring up. And if you would just let us know where in the Puget Sound region you live. All right, hopefully you all can see the results of that poll. It looks like we've got a uh, majority today with us from King County, as well as some from uh, Pierce and Snohomish counties and some that are outside the region. So thank you for participating in that. All right. So uh, again, a little bit of background, and, and for those of you who are familiar with PSRC, you, you are certainly aware of this, but as you all know, we have been a fast-growing region. We were certainly a fast-growing region before the pandemic. We have continued to grow, although perhaps a little bit more slowly during the pandemic, but we are forecasting out to 2050, and we are expecting 1.6 million more people and 1.1 million jobs. And so our, our work is to address the, the needs of the, the people who live here today and the jobs that are here today, as well as planning for those uh, people and jobs out into the future. Everything we do starts with vision. So Vision 2050 is our overarching policy framework document. It has multi-county planning policies and goals and objectives related to a variety of aspects uh, of the world we live in from transportation to housing to the environment. Uh, this is Vision 2050 describes how and where we're going to accommodate all that growth from the previous slide. And then the regional transportation plan and the regional economic strategy are kind of the functional implementation plans feeding from Vision 2050. And we're here today, of course, we wanna to talk to you about the regional transportation plan. This is a document that we update um, required under federal and state law. We, we update this every four years. 
And this plan is again from today, 2022, uh, looking far into the future, 2050. So we've been working on uh, development of this plan for a few years now, and we sat down with our decision makers and really thought through the objectives. We were fresh off of Vision 2050, which was adopted in October of 2020. And these were the, these were the, the two objectives uh, that we thought it would be really mindful as we're developing this plan is to one, recognize that we have real challenges on the ground today, and we want to address those as well as the future needs of the system. And our, our cities and counties are working on updates to their comprehensive plans. And so there's an opportunity with this regional transportation plan to really support those efforts and provide better data and analysis to both uh, look into regional long range planning, but also to support local investment planning. And then in addition, we are planning for 2050. And as you, you saw from the earlier, earlier chart, we are expecting a lot of people coming to the region by that time. So what are some of the, the next big system investments that we need to be thinking of now and getting in front of? That could be um, further expansion of high capacity transit. It could be uh, 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 capacity and improvements related to aviation or to new passenger only ferries. But it's a, a good time for us to be thinking about and getting ahead of that planning today. We also sat down with decision makers and asked them to think about the key policy focus areas that would be um, emphasis areas in this plan. And these are the six. Um, we'll talk a little bit more uh, uh, about them coming forward, but access to transit. So we are, as you'll see from uh, a, a few slides in, we are planning for a significant expansion of our transit system. But in addition to building the network, we need to be thinking about how people access that transit system, whether it's um, bicycle lanes, sidewalks, um, shuttle services, park and rides. Safety, of course, is a, is a big emphasis area in the plan. We know that safety for all users of the system is, is critical. Equity, making sure that we are, we are looking at providing an equitable transit system, equitable access um, for all users of the system and various of our uh, community groups. Climate, we have in Vision 2050, we of course we are um, trying to achieve climate goals by 2050 and how does the regional transportation plan help support that? And then again, recognizing that we have local agency needs to address. And as I said earlier, really thinking about those, those future investments that we should be planning for today. So one of the other things that we've been working on over the last few years that we're really proud of is we spent a lot of time really gathering as much data as possible in new ways than we had done before. Um, as the four county regional body, we can't track and monitor you know, every single facility out there. So for example, the local roadway in front of your house, that's not the thing that we focus on, but we do focus on those, those um, larger portions of the system that, that carry more people, whether that's uh, transit or roadway or ferries. So we spent a lot of time gathering information. For example, for the first time, we have uh, information on the sidewalk, sidewalk inventory on arterials throughout the region. We have information on bicycle facilities. We have information on signals and freight routes and transit stops. And we brought all of that data into a visualization tool where you can zoom into various areas around the region and really see what's going on in context of the local community. So you will be able to look at this data in, in context with um, uh, demographic and community groups, where congestion is located. And the screenshot in front of you is showing where the existing sidewalk and bicycle facilities are on arterials as they relate to transit stops. So we think this is really useful information to see where are the gaps and opportunities today we also have a forecast look of the, the known planned investments on the books today, the known where the growth is coming, what, what congestion might look like in the future, and again, an opportunity to zoom in and see where are the gaps, where are the opportunities for the next round of planning. We've also been doing a tremendous amount of outreach. So as you know, the draft plan is out for public comment right now, but leading up to the development of the draft plan, we did a significant amount of outreach. We had a representative survey where we heard from 1900 uh, individuals responding to things like what they need from the transportation system. What are their current challenges? What are their current barriers? What would they hope to see in the future? Um, and I'll share a little bit more about what we've been hearing in just a moment. We reached out to youth groups throughout the four counties. 
We reached out to um, focus groups and we did follow-up interviews from the survey. We put that same survey up on our website and we heard from an additional 1,400 people. And we've continued to do outreach to various stakeholders around the region, really trying to understand um, people's perspectives of what the transportation system needs to be for their um, getting to work, getting to school, getting to the grocery store. Here's some examples of the things that we're hearing. There's a lot of bullets on this slide and I certainly won't read all of them, but it's also very practical information that's, that should be of no surprise. People want reliable, well-maintained roads. They wanna have a well-connected transit network that they can get from their neighborhood to their destination. They want more destinations. They want complete bicycle and pedestrian facilities. In order to use transit more, they'd like to see shorter trip times and easier to access. An extended service beyond, uh, beyond those commute hours, but particularly on the right-hand side, here's some information that we've heard from folks with special transportation needs, having service uh, at hours when they're needed. Maybe that's, that's evenings, maybe that's weekends, maybe that's Sundays. Access to health and medical appointments is also a key factor uh, for those folks who have special transportation needs, what they would like to see from their transportation system. There is a report in the draft plan that talks more about what we've been hearing to date. And then as we collect um, additional data from public comment, we'll provide all of that information on our website as well. As I mentioned, we're gonna continue to do outreach. So we've continued, we've already had some focus groups with um, historically underrepresented communities. We'll be shortly reaching out to the business community. Um, and we are, we are doing, um, uh, public webinars like the one today, we're happy to come to uh, any organization that would like to learn more about the draft plan. The, this outreach, along with the public comments we received through the public comment period, all of this will be presented to our board for their uh, review and consideration. So I'm gonna move into now, and I'm just only gonna share some highlights with you. There's a lot of information on the plan performance. It's available on our website but I'm just gonna run through some quick highlights to give you a flavor. So again, we are planning for the next 28 years out to 2050 and it's $300 billion of investment. As has been the case for many years, our transportation plan um, puts a priority on maintaining, preserving and operating the system. So that's more than half of the total investment planned. From the remaining investments, 70% of the plan's investments for system improvements are focused on local and regional transit. And that translates into by 2050, 36 bus rapid transit routes, 10 passenger only ferry routes, 116 miles of light rail station with over 80 stations, a light rail, excuse me, light rail with over 80 stations. Now you might ask, how do we pay for all of this? What we do, we have a financial strategy for the draft plan where we look at all of the available revenues that are uh, on the books today. We forecast those into the future. And the good news is that with those current revenue sources, the majority of the plan can be funded, 84%. The remaining 16%, we identify a menu of new revenue sources that the region could pursue to fully fund the remaining investments. Um, and we have a history in our region of, of achieving some of those new investments, whether that's new um, local sources, whether that's uh, state transportation funding or additional sources. We have had over the last decade, um, uh, we have seen that trend where new revenue sources are being achieved. And so we feel that this is a, a good solid financial strategy. So this is just an example, the next two slides. This is just a visual of the current high capacity transit system. It is as of 2018, as opposed to 2022. There's a variety of reasons, but our 2018 is our, our um, current model base year. So this is the 2018 high capacity transit network. And this is the 2050 high capacity transit network. So there's a, a significant expansion of high capacity transit. There will also then be the corresponding um, recalibration and expansion of local transit routes to feed into this service. It's hard to see from this map, but we've also within our tools looked at where the future growth is anticipated to be and how well this high capacity transit network is serving that growth. And I believe with one exception, this high capacity transit network is planned to serve those areas with uh, the highest amount of growth that's coming to the region by 2050. So moving into some of the performance measures, we are, as a regional body, we certainly provide regional metrics. 
but we're also taking the time to look uh, look at, at, at smaller geogra geographies as well. And this is this slide is just an example of some of those metrics. And I'll give you some examples of, of particular um, uh, performance measures. But we can look at plan performance by county. We can look at various uh, sub geographies of the region and the regional geographies as identified in Vision 2050. And then we also look at equity focus areas. And those are those places around the region that have higher percentage than the regional average people of color, people with low incomes, youth and older adults, people with limited English proficiency and people with disabilities. So for um, relevant performance metrics where there is a distinction, we can demonstrate um, both the regional metric as well as the sub-geography metric. So I'm just gonna run through a handful of, of key highlights from the plan, as I mentioned, all of this information is in the plan document. It is peppered throughout each element. So if you're in the transit chapter, you can learn a little bit more about the transit performance, but we also have a, a plan performance, um, both a section in the plan document as well as a full appendix. So this slide is demonstrating that by 2050, with that significant expansion of high capacity transit, transit boardings are forecasted to more than triple. Households will have an increased level of access to that high capacity transit service. And this graph is an example of the different types of, of geographies that the plan uh, can demonstrate. So you can see the region on the right hand side and the various Vision 2050 geographies throughout this chart. By 2050, the average person will walk or bike 21% more than today. And this chart is a, a reflection of an example of a metric where, again, on the right-hand side, the regional metric, and then also showing that same metric for people of color and people of lower income. Looking at the amount of time spent in congestion, in 2018, the average household spent over 60 hours a year in congestion. With the plan's investments and policies by 2050, the average household is actually spent, uh, anticipated to spend less time sitting in, sitting in traffic, 15% reduction by 2050 from the base year. Looking at miles traveled, oops, I beg your pardon, I, my mouse went a little too fast. The average household in 2018 drove more, almost 16,000 miles per year. This is expected to decrease by 2050 as well, a 23% reduction in the average house, the miles driven by average household by 2050. And this chart is, is recognizing our four-part greenhouse gas strategy and how the, tr the regional transportation plan, the plan to achieve our climate goals by 2050. There's a lot of information in the plan related to all of the elements that achieve this goal, but it reflects uh, a number of things. I apologize. I am trying to move my screen around and I keep clicking the wrong, wrong slide. So this chart is reflecting the impact of the, the regional growth strategy and Vision 2050. It's reflecting the impacts of all of the investments, the multimodal improvements, the expansion of the high capacity transit network in the regional transportation plan. It's recognizing that over time, we will continue to see fuel economy improvements for the vehicle fleet. But then it's also recognizing that to meet the climate goals, we do need to transition to a zero emission transportation system. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of information in the plan behind each one of these parts of the graph and explaining um, the plan and all the, also the activities that, that are being taken in the region to get here. So I'm gonna pause here and we're gonna do another poll. And we're asking you to identify from this list, what are your top three transportation priorities? So Michaela, take it away. We'll give it just a moment to get maximum participation before we see the results. Great. 
All right. It looks like the top priority from the, the participants today, reliable, well-connected transit, followed by complete network for bicycles and pedestrian, also highly rated expanded transit, reliable, well-maintained roads and highways. And then it looks like some equal participation in widespread electric vehicle charging stations, as well as high-speed rail. So very consistent with the themes from the outreach that we've conducted to date. Thank you. Okay. So that was a very quick flyover of some of the some of the information that's in the plan, as well as the performance metrics. As I mentioned, we've got a lot of information available. We tried to break it down into um, uh, uh, e easy to read uh, chapters and, and topic areas in the plan. So I just want to take a little bit of time and walk through our Engage website. So this is our online open house. You can see the, the URL at the top. And what you'll find here is on uh, the main page, you can see some uh, links to specific videos. We've tried to provide two to three minute videos on 12 of the major topic areas, introducing those topics and then providing a direct link to where you can find the um, information in the plan document. You can see we have information on the, the three webinars and this presentation I believe is also now posted. On the right-hand side of the Engage page, you can see where you can find the actual document. The, you can view the full document, you can view the appendices, as well as the plan by chapter. This is a screenshot of the video page. So if you were to click on um, accessing the, the videos, you can see kind of the on the right-hand side, the, um, the thumbnails for all 12, and then zooming in. And then this is if you, for example, if you had clicked on the equity video, you would be taken to this page. You can uh, view the video, which looks like it's about four minutes. And then below that video, you can see where you can click the regional equity analysis, which is an appendix of the plan, as well as the section of chapter, chapter two, where you can learn more. Equity is one of those topics, of course, that we address throughout each element of the plan, but it also has a standalone section as well as that regional equity analysis appendix. You can also see, again, look over on the right-hand side, you can see the independent um, chapters where you can find the appendices. You can comment directly from the Engage site below each video and also from the main page. You can also um, send us a comment via email or by mail. So where we are in the schedule, as you know, we're, we, it is out for public comment through the end of February. We are trying to gather as much um, outreach and feedback as we can, and then we will be working with our boards uh, from now through April. Uh, the board, the Transportation Policy Board and Executive Board are scheduled to recommend action on the plan, and then our General Assembly is scheduled to adopt the plan in May of 2022. And with that, um, thank you for letting me provide some highlights and I'll turn it back over to Ben to walk through some questions. Great, thank you, Kelly. We have a lot of qu good questions queued up and so we'll just start from the top. Um, so I'll read out this question and Kelly, then you can direct, I think, um, or I can identify who might wanna answer it. So the first question has to do with passenger only ferries. And so what are passenger only ferry routes? Does this mean pedestrians only with no cars? And can these run during the day and not just during rush hours so that people can take leisure day trips to somewhere walk to some walkable areas? Can tourist information be developed for this? So maybe uh, if I think I believe Gill's with us and may want to speak to passenger only ferries and how those are designed and planned for. Thank you, Ben. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, yeah, so passenger only ferries, that is correct. They are, uh, people can walk on, pedestrians uh, access the uh, ferries. You can bring your bicycles on. I think great examples of uh, passenger only ferries currently are the uh, West Seattle, downtown Seattle. We have uh, uh, Kitsap Transit runs several uh, routes between Bremerton, uh, Kingston to downtown Seattle, places like that. And I think that uh, in terms of the questions that the, uh, the questioner is asking, you can operate these outside of the commute hours, I believe. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, there's some examples in our region already of, of uh, routes that do operate outside of commute hours. Um, so, so that is an option. And then, and then I think it's also alluding to uh, you know tourists and wayfinding and things like that. That has been something from our passenger only ferry study that we uh, did uh, or ended last early last year that we did find out that uh, a lot. This is a 
form of transportation that uh, tourists like to use. So those, those are all part, part, possible and part, part of the uh, uh, planning for passenger only ferries. And I think uh, our plan does include expansion of passenger only ferries to some new routes that are, that are out there. I think you'll see some from Shoal Shoal and Ballard to downtown Seattle. There's some proposals for some uh, routes in Lake Washington as well. So um, do I think that answers it? Is that right? Yeah, great, thank you, Gil. Um, the next question. Um, so, Kelly, you mentioned that transit will s serve communities of color very well. And, Gil, you may want to stay on with this as well. And maybe, Jean, uh, how is displacement considered in um, that analysis? Yeah, I might actually call on um, Jean to maybe spend a little time talking about the, the regional equity analysis. Sure. Um, <laughs> Jean Kim, I'm with Puget Sound Regional Council. I'm a senior planner who worked on the equity analysis, which is standalone um, appendix of the RTP. And we looked at the areas with high concentrations of people of color and other equity and focused populations in the plan. Um, Displacement, we have a displacement risk analysis tool um, that PSRC um, worked on and developed. And um, that is um, one of the tools and resources we use for the equity analysis in the plan. Um, but um, I would defer to Craig for uh, to answer this question um, in more comprehensive way. Um, Craig, you wanna join? <laughs> Should have had my video on. Sorry about that. So yeah, so to answer your question, um, so we have a variety of tools at PSRC as we've developed um, data and analysis that helps us understand where the greatest risk for displacement are. And so as we look for those places and where the transit systems are being expanded, we wanna look and understand whether we have policies in place to ensure that displacement doesn't happen. And so we have um, analysis of where the highest risks of displacement are. And we have a whole variety of um, metrics that go into that. So we can, uh, that's what happens when you hit your space bar. Sorry about that. Um, so we can understand where those greatest opportunities and risks are for displacement. And so that we can make sure that we're working with policies to ensure that displacement doesn't occur. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Gene. And I, I'd also add that, um, these are the sorts of tools that we are hoping to provide, that we are providing to our members as they do the on the ground analysis of, of specific individual transportation projects um, as part of the permitting and environmental review and sort of neighborhood review of those types of projects. And it's the responsibility of cities to, or, or the implementing agency, it might be a transit agency or a transportation agency, to identify the real mitigation strategies or the, the policies and programs they put in place to ensure that displacement does not occur. And so in uh, we have resources um, with, that identify the, the types of mitigation measures that can, can be employed and examples of those. And so those are available um, for our members and for members of the community as well. So the next question, Kelly, has to do with prioritization in, um, in Appendix D of the plan, which is the regional capacity project list, um, there are prioritization scores. And so what do those scores mean? And what is a, a high versus a medium versus a low score? Sure, great question. So back, I believe it was in 2014, our board adopted what we called a prioritization framework. And it identifies some of the, the key transportation related policies from vision that we then applied to the projects submitted for the long range plan. They are also very similar for those of you who are familiar with PSRC's funding process, the themes of supporting centers, supporting jobs, um, emission reduction, travel improvement, safety. The themes are very similar, but they're at a different scale because these are these are projects. Some of the projects are uh, within the first decade and they are actively you know, pursuing implementation. Some of these projects, because we are a long range plan, they won't begin until 2030 or 2040. And so there's a series of questions related to those policy areas um, that have been translated into two point values. Each sponsor responds to those themselves. So they are to some extent self-scored. And then it's just, it's, it's a piece of information that we provide to our board. These are all of the projects that are being uh, requested to be entering into the long range plan. And we provide this overall score. Not every project will hit every policy topic area. 
And then the board can can choose, and, and it's tied somewhat to the available resources in the financial strategy as well. The board can look at those and see, do projects need to be um, moved to on our unprogrammed portion of the plan, for example, or are they staying in our financially constrained plan? So that's um, how that works. I don't have a sense of, in, in front of me, I don't have a sense of you know, what it means to be a high, medium, or low, but it is information that we also track over time. So we looked at this suite of projects, we had relatively few new projects that were being submitted into the plan. To a large extent, these are projects that have been um, carried forward and, and re-evaluated from, uh, they've, been, they've been being planned by local jurisdictions for some time. But we look to see from, you know, from the last plan and the plan before, how are these, these projects comparing in terms of meeting overall policy objectives? So, um, we have um, some information, some background information on what, uh, what's included in the prioritization framework. We have information from uh, board presentations about the, the mix of projects and how they all landed. Happy to, happy to share more of that, but it is just one more piece of information in terms of the diversity of types of projects and how well they are all uh, meeting those various um, prioritization framework and the vision policies. Great, thank you, Kelly. Um, next, we have a question about level of service standards and level of service standards for state highways and local arterials. Uh, there's a link to our website about uh, to some resources on levels of service. And so I guess the question is, is there talk of applying the same level of service standards for state highways to local arterials as well? That's a really complicated question. And this is not something that we really address in the regional transportation plan. I know that there are, are quite a number of conversations right now going around about um, level of service and, and moving more to multimodal level of service. Uh, and there, there certainly is a distinction between um, what's applied for state highways versus arterials. That is not something that PSRC has tackled in the regional transportation plan, but we are participating in a variety of forums to have those conversations. And maybe I'll just do a shout out to either um, Craig or Jennifer, if Jennifer's on the line as well, because I know you you all perhaps have also been uh, participating in some of those other conversations that are happening at the statewide level about uh, a new way of approaching level of service. Anything either one of you would wanna to add to that? Not me, but I was gonna see if Jennifer might have something to offer. As, as Kelly was saying, it is definitely a very complicated question. And I'd add one thing before Jennifer jumps in, if she cares to, is that level of service standards, for those of you who aren't familiar, they're ways of evaluating um, performance of particular roadway segments, typically. And there are different ways of doing that. You can do that through measuring volumes of vehicles that are traveling through those segments. You can look at delay in those areas, sort of congestion levels. And so when folks say things like multimodal um, approaches to looking at levels of service, that means, um, you know, looking at a roadway segment and, and understanding just what, what not just vehicle volumes, but what people volumes or, or goods movement is that segment actually accommodating? And can you achieve um, uh, levels of service standards in that segment that people are, are, are happy with or, or content with? Um, using other means than simply widening the roadway or, or you know, maybe signal timing or things like that. And, the, and those programs are usually um, addressed through what are called concurrency programs. Those standards are usually incorporated into concurrency programs, which are part of the Growth Management Act. We're getting really in the weeds here, um, but it has to do with um, having uh, being able to demonstrate that you have infrastructure available that is adequate to serve anticipated growth as you're permitting new um, housing and commercial activity and so forth. So um, yeah, there's a lot in um, all of um, that discussion that we don't deal with directly in the regional transportation plan. Anything to add, Jennifer, or should we move on? I will just add one minor thing, or maybe not minor, but the, as Ben mentioned, this is established under the Growth Management Act, and, and really what it says and still says is that local jurisdictions have to establish level of, of service standards, but does not tell local jurisdictions what it needs to be. And so it's really up to the local jurisdiction to determine what is the uh, 
a appropriate level of operation. So all of these conversations that everybody else has been referencing is um, are definitely happening now and kind of what level of service means and what should be included as part of the conversation. But at the end of all of that, as as kind of the, the rules are written now, it's really it's up to the local jurisdiction to determine what is like acceptable operation, what those thresholds are within its own jurisdiction. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. So the next question has to do, and this is probably a modeling question, Craig. Um, what is the reduction of time spent in congestion congestion predicated on? What uh, what under what assumptions do we have that show that congestion reduction? Yeah. So um, it's really everything is in our regional transportation plan. It's it's an output of our models. So we build models from observed information. And so we have all kinds of resources on our website that can describe what our, our models do, but all the inputs that go into the models, so you saw that slide early on that talked about how many people and jobs are in the region. We forecast where those people live. And so there's changes in those growth patterns. And if people live closer to trans transit infrastructure as an example, and if they're using transit more, that can definitely have an impact on congestion. So it's where people are living, it's the, the network supply. So that's what available for transit, for walking, for biking, for vehicles. It's the capacity projects that are in the plan. It's any sort of demand management aspects that we might have in the plan. So all those different pieces put together and analyzed as part of our analytical tools and our modeling, they lead to the outcomes that we measure and then we report and so that, um, that performance and showing that reduction in congestion is really an outcome of all the different investments in the plan, the different policies working together. And their net result is actually less congestion per household than there is today. Hopefully that made some sense. I think it did. Thank you, Craig. So um, Kelly, I know this one's for you. Um, the projected reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is profound. Can you please elaborate on what assumptions were made to develop that estimate and what is needed to get there? Sure. It's, it's a very similar response to what Craig just mentioned. So we start with, um, I mentioned we have a four-part greenhouse gas strategy. So when we talk about PSRC's analysis, and I, I failed to mention this earlier, there are a lot of different sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the region. We focus on trans, on-road transportation emissions and it's on-road transportation emissions as they are influenced by a number of things, one of which, of course, is land use. And so first and foremost, we start with Vision 2050 and the regional growth strategy, which is focusing growth around high capacity transit, focusing growth in compact communities. Then we look to the investments and the policies in the regional transportation plan, which includes that significant uh, expansion of the high capacity transit network and the uh, local transit service that's, that's supporting neighborhoods and feeding into that. That also includes all of the other multimodal investments and bicycle and pedestrian and roadway improvements that are helping to move traffic more smoothly. We have assumptions on uh, pricing, which is another component of the four-part strategy. There are, as you all know, there are pricing mechanisms on the ground today, State Route 520, State Route 99, just as a few examples. We have um, select uh, the expansion of express toll lanes in, in, on some key state facilities into the future, as well as a, a ultimate transition in the latter part of the plan to a road usage charge. And that road usage charge can both serve to raise needed transportation revenue, but it also serves along with things like express toll lanes managing demand. So we analyze all of those. Those are the, the policies and investments that are directed through our long range plans. And we analyze that those are very important and very critical for a variety of reasons, and they do reduce emissions, but they don't get us all the way to the goal. And so then we look at the fourth part of the overall strategy, which is decarbonization. And very consistent with the work around that's going on around the state, around the country, uh, with, our, with our partners at the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency, that last box is what will it take in terms of decarbonization of the system we happen to look at, you know, base building off of what we know is going on and building off of some of the projections out there. We assumed if we convert by 2050, 90% of the passenger vehicle fleet and 50% of the um, um, medium and heavy duty truck fleet, with all four pieces of, of that important progression, again, from land use, transportation choices, pricing and decarbonization, we do believe that we can get to um, the goal by 2050. 
Not to say that that's easy. There's still a lot of investment and a lot of focus that needs to happen all along the way in all four of those boxes. But that's the background on um, what we believe it's going to take to get there. Each of them is each of them is really critical, and each of them is really going to take uh, commitment and action. And we tried to do our best in the plan document to lay out what it would take and some of the um, the next steps that are um, both underway and also necessary in order to actually implement those pieces. Great, thank you, Kelly. Um, I, I think I understand this question. It, the phrasing is a little, so I'll just read it out. How much are the performance measures in the regional transportation plan shaped by the regional transportation plan itself rather than just capturing all existing local plans? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. If the person that posed it may want to rephrase it and enter it again in the q and I, I would just say that our, Regional transportation plan is made up of the projects that local jurisdictions identify. There are some assumptions that we have about things like potential for road usage charges or other fees or costs associated with transportation. Obviously, the the land use assumptions that are of what 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 land use patterns will look like in the future are things that we put together at the regional scale. So some of these performance, um, the performance that we see has to do with the interaction of a lot of those things, the, the you know, accessibility, uh, price, uh, distance, and where activities are. Um, it all works together in one integrated system. Anything to add on performance, Craig or Kelly? The only thing I was going to add is, as you, and, and you touched on it in, on your last sentence there, that this is very much an integrated and iterative process. PSRC does not propose individual capital projects, but we do have our overarching um, policy framework and, and policies and focus areas and Vision 2050 uh, focus on that regional growth strategy, the transit focus, um, supporting high capacity transit, the, the identification of the pricing elements and, and in that nature. So while we don't identify the projects, we do have a, um, there's programmatic elements of the plan. As I mentioned, we can't track every single facility. And then for those larger projects, uh, sponsors submit them into the plan, they fill out an application, they respond to the prioritization framework, and th that is what we do analyze. But I would also say that it is a feedback loop because this plan, I showed you a, a, a snapshot of the visualization tool. It's an opportunity to say, this is what's being planned, both from the regional and local perspective. Where, how, is it, how are we doing? Where are the gaps? Where are the opportunities? And that will then feed into this upcoming local comprehensive plan process. And in four years, we will do this again and we'll evaluate where are we and how are we doing as a region with our planned investments to meeting our goals and objectives. So Craig, anything else you would add to that? Um, I was gonna say almost the exact same thing. So it's that idea of one of the, the powers that we have with the plan is to provide information to people. So as Kelly was articulating there, highlighting where gaps might exist, especially as we forecast more growth coming into the region. And it's that constant feedback loop. And, and it's been mentioned already, but just good to reiterate, we update the regional transportation plan every four years. So it really is a ongoing document. We, we finish it and then we're almost starting the next thing. And this plan then feeds all the local planning that also happens. And so it is one big continuous feedback loop. Excellent, thanks, Craig. Um, here's a definition one, Kelly. Um, what does it mean for a project to be unprogrammed? What would prompt the board to move something to, I think th they meant from unprogrammed to say into the constrained portion of the plan or vice versa? That is a great question. And I will um, attempt to dust off my uh, definitional logistics here and, and capture it. So within the overall, overall plan, we have the majority of the plan is covered in what we call the financially constrained plan. These are the projects that are candidate projects. They move through. Every project is required to get approval from our boards before they move to implementation. But these are the projects that are kind of within that financial constraint. They are ready to move forward once the plan is adopted. Sponsors voluntarily request projects to be in the unprogrammed portion of the plan. And we would characterize these as more um, perhaps conceptual ideas. The, the project sponsors are, um, they're not quite sure um, maybe some of the details of what these projects might look like or the timing, um, but they want to have them kind of captured in, in the broader environmental aspect. So the full plan, including those unprogrammed investments, we analyze and we report on under our SEPA requirements, but a portion of the plan, and it's probably, 
90 plus percent is within the financial constraints. So the unprogrammed projects, again, they're, um, they're a little bit more illustrative. Project sponsors may choose either through an amendment process, which we offer um, roughly every two years, or as part of the next plan, they might choose to say, okay, we've been doing a little bit more study on these. We want these now to come over. Um, the board and PSRC does not generally kind of grab those unprogrammed unpro projects and move them over. That's really more of a sponsor request. But as I mentioned, if they're depending on plan outcomes, the board could look at projects that are in the financially constrained plan and suggest maybe they're not quite ready, they should be moved over. That has not happened um, for this plan, but, but that, that is um, always a, a potential with that, that distinction between the kind of the, the life and development and where a plan a project is in its overall planning. So hopefully that hopefully that made some sense. And this is uh, what may be a related question, Kelly. So focusing on the WashDOT projects listed in Independent State, so Washington State Department of Transportation projects, if we have concerns about project details and timing, would it be appropriate to provide comment on the draft RTP or more appropriate to reach out to WashDOT directly? That is a great question. Um, I think you could do both. I think, um, if you have concerns about any investment, the draft plan, including the projects, are out for public comment. We welcome your feedback, and we would certainly share that comment with both the board and with WashDOT. There's also an opportunity, I, I briefly touched on this, but I didn't explain myself. Every project that comes into the plan, they come in as a candidate project. And by being on the regional capacity project list, these are, these are the larger scale projects on the regional system, and they require more review. So before any of these projects can actually be implemented, once they have their environmental document completed and they've chosen a final preferred alternative, before they move into purchasing right-of-way and moving into construction, they request approval from our board. So that is another checkpoint. So the projects, when they come into the plan, they are still somewhat um, depending on where they are in the three decades, some of them are more conceptual than others. And so there's still a couple, one more check before those projects move forward. And we have to evaluate all of these to make sure that they are still consistent with our overall plan as being analyzed. So that was a long-winded way of saying, um, uh, I think we welcome your feedback on any of that, but of course you can always reach out to the project sponsor as well. And to clarify, this is another question um, or a nuance of the unprogrammed. So there was a follow-up, I think, from the same um, person who posed the question. So if a project is unprogrammed, it can't be built at all, or it just can't receive funding from PSRC? So the way that the rules are is that the regional transportation plan is supposed, and particularly we, um, we have, a, it's a little bit bureaucratic, but we have what we have to do an, an air quality conformity analysis. And so we are required to capture all of these regionally significant projects in our plan and we analyze them and we report on um, how well they, the full system is maintaining our, our federal and state air quality conformity requirements. So a project being an unprogrammed, we say that, um, you can pursue planning, but you have to be in the financially constrained plan before that project, regardless of how it's funded. It doesn't matter if it's federal funds or local funds or state funds. A project needs to be in the financially constrained plan as if it's above that certain threshold before it can actually move forward towards implementation. Now, having said that, you know, we don't have uh, uh, a lot of eyes out there on enforcement. We can't uh, can't necessarily prevent uh, projects with all local funds being moved forward. But there is that check. And especially um, under SEPA and NEPA, there's there's a couple of cross checks throughout the way to make sure that those larger scale investments are going through the proper long range planning process. Definitely, we're digging into some of the, the real yeah. needs of a regional transportation plan. So hopefully... <laughs> Um, folks are, are following along. Um, I'll take a crack at, at this one initially, but I think there's also, there's a larger answer um, that Craig may want to add, um, address. So this was a follow-up to something earlier. So this regarding displacement for um, people of color, lower income folks, um, and how we measure access to transit. There's the metric Kelly about the number of households and the, and the different types of households and proximity to high capacity transit in the future. So the question actually is, so do we assume no displacement for measuring access to transit for these populations? And I guess the answer is no, we don't assume that. We, we try to identify where the risk is through tools like the displacement risk analysis, 
Um, we try to identify where we think there may be um, pressure and we identify mitigation measures um, that local jurisdictions have employed to try to address displacement. There are some technical reasons why it's difficult for us to model and forecast the distribution of different population groups in the future that I think Craig can maybe um, provide some insight on. Craig? Yeah. So I was going to share, and it's a great question. It's if you look at modeling and forecasting um, all around the country, when it comes to forecasting race, most estimates of population by race are done at the state level and not any lower than that. And so it's um, really, really challenging to try to forecast, especially at, say, the neighborhood level, um, the racial distribution of a neighborhood. But we want to do it and we continue to work um, to improve those tools. And so we are doing lots of work at the regional council here in terms of our household travel survey, as an example. It's what we build our models from. And in our last survey and moving forward, we've been working more and more um, in different ways to get more representative samples from people of color so that we can then better inform our modeling and forecasting ability, especially as it relates to race. Um, and so it's one of the reasons that now we tend to focus and it, it probably, it, it's a little more obvious if you look at the plan and see it and maybe it didn't come across from our description, but when we talk about equity focus areas, um, one of the ways we work right now to try to get beyond the limitations of what we can model is we use information about where people live today to understand as Ben was just describing those places where we have some of the highest risks for displacement as an example. And so we want to focus there um, as we continue to work to get our analytical tools to be able to analyze things like race better uh, moving forward. Hopefully that helps answer the question a little bit at least. Great. Thank you, Craig. And I also would point you to the equity analysis um, appendix. There's a great discussion of how we identify those equity focus areas, um, what thresholds we use, how we map them. You can also look in the appendix for the coordinated mobility plan, which looks at um, uh, projects and planning for specialized people, folks with, with specialized transportation needs that also has a discussion of the way that we identify these areas for analysis. Um, so the last question we have in the queue right now is about um, roads uh, that are planned for widening. Have we done an analysis of how much increased VMT and greenhouse gas emissions this will cause? And how, have we investigated alternative methods for reducing congestion? Craig, do you want to start that with some of the um, the work behind the model and maybe some of the sensitivity analysis, and I can jump in as necessary? Sure, um, you'll definitely have to jump in. Um, so, and maybe I, I would clarify. So, when we analyze things um, for the plan, we don't analyze individual projects themselves. We analyze the entire system of projects. Um, so, when you talk about you know plan for widening, we definitely do. Um, air quality analysis and greenhouse gas emissions analysis from our modeling tied to the changes in the network, tied to the capacity expansion, as well as all the transit work and everything else that is in there. Um, and as the models run, we then estimate greenhouse gas emissions from the outputs of, of the modeling of all the projects and how they work together. Um, so Short answer is we definitely do analyze um, how these projects and their impact is, what their impact is on BMT and greenhouse gas emissions, but not at a project specific level, but at a plan specific level. I think Kelly, you can add probably lots more detail. Well, I think the only thing I would add, I think that's the most important part is that we are looking at one integrated system and how it all works together, including you know all of the land use assumptions. But we did, um, we did take a look more carefully at all of the projects on the list. We looked at in terms of the and Craig, correct me. It's been a while since I've looked at our at our details, but I believe five percent increase in lane miles in 2050 from today's network. So while there certainly are roadway capacity projects, they're not um, massive investments in additional lane miles. We also look to see what those those um, projects are actually doing, and we have a section in the document where we elaborate a little bit more on the types of projects and and. The both the benefit and the intent behind them. I, they are serving, I believe that the statistic was over half of all of our bus lane miles as well as our heavy truck miles. So they're improving um, the travel flow, both for general purpose traffic, but also for our buses, also for our trucks. Um, there were only a handful, I believe, that were, I can't remember, apologies, it's been, it's been a while since I looked at all the details. It's been, been about a month. Um, 
in terms of the overall magnitude of those projects, I believe there were six that were kind of larger scale. And those six are larger projects, for example, the 405 program, the gateway program, and the rest of the projects were really focused on, you know, specific areas of uh, where there's current congestion and, and current need. So not to say that, you know, we're not coming down one side or the other in terms of, of judgment on those projects, but we did take more time to evaluate where are the projects, what are they doing, and what are those, those overall um, um, system-wide uh, impacts that they're, they're working on. And you had it right, Kelly, it's 5% increase in lane miles total. Excellent. Thank you both. Well, we're running towards just a couple minutes left. Uh, maybe one thing I'll, I can conclude, Kelly, I don't see any additional questions coming through. Um, just first to say yeah, thank you all for participating today. Um, if you haven't yet, you have an opportunity to, opportunity to comment on the draft plan as we mentioned through the website um, form, comment form through email or um, by US mail to our office. Um, we're, we'll be summarizing all of these comments and providing not only the summaries, but the actual comments uh, that we receive to our board. Um, they will be uh, evaluating those and seeing if, the, if any specific comments are asking for uh, specific amendments or changes to the plan, they'll consider those changes. Um, some comments that we will get, we know we'll get them. Um, we're not perfect. We know, we know that typos and other clarifications will be needed to be incorporated into the plan. And so we'll be doing some of that over the next um, couple of months um, after we've concluded the public comment period. Um, and um, all, we also then post all of the comments on our website so the public can see um, what comments we've received as well. And with that, we are at 12.58 by my clock, Kelly. We can wait a couple minutes and see if anyone has any further comments or questions. Um, we're happy to, to use up the full amount of time um, if you'd like us to. And I'll just express my thanks. So we still have a few minutes to everyone who uh, joined us today. And uh, please definitely take a look through our online open house. And uh, we look forward to receiving your feedback.